So my first encounter with the Dvorak Stavat Mater was actually an exploration, a deeper exploration of Dvorak himself. We had the opportunity to perform with Maris Janssens, who is this fantastic European co uh, conductor, and perform the Dvorak Requiem. And he was in the middle of trying to record all of Dvorak's works. And of course, he's famous for his symphonies, especially the From the New World Symphony, his Symphony No. 8. But pieces like the Requiem and the Stava Mater weren't as often performed. And so after performing the Requiem, you know, all of us were we're exploring all things Dvorak, and the Stabat Mater was especially something very powerful. Because the Stabat Mater was created out of a need to express. Um, Dvorak had experienced great tragedy with his three children dying at a very young age. And so, whereas once he had a house that was full of youthful energy, all of a sudden it was silent. And so he wrote music for the Staba Mater, which is the telling the, of Mary and the pain that she must have felt when seeing her son on the crucifix and dying. And so Dvorak, being a romantic composer, has a lot of depth of expression through his articulations especially and his harmonies. And <coughs> for instance, he is very, very specific with his articulations, whether he uses an accent, Mercado accent or sforzato, you know, and <clears throat> they all mean very different things. And having performed a lot of Dvorak over my career, you get to have an understanding of what he's trying to say with each of these. And when he writes, uh, for instance, in one movement that we're doing with the Stam Mater, an accent over every single note, what sort of emphasis he's requiring of the performers and of the text at that point. I think that once you get into the Romantic era where composers start to compose with overt emotions and trying to express emotions, you get programmatic works like with works with chorus that have text. There is a greater there's a greater emphasis on coloring specific words. We were talking about this section in one of the movements where it says, please do not view me with bitterness as I try to soothe your tears, as I try to shoulder some of your pain, as was you know, said to Mary. And the word is the word bitter. And the way he, Dvorak, sets the word bitter, amara, each time, it's very meaningful. And there's a lot of emphasis musically um, towards that word. The more you know about the piece itself, the more ways you look at it, the different angles, the context that you look at, um, from which you look at it, um, all will give you an understanding of it. And so knowing other pieces of Dvorak, knowing how he set choral music, knowing his symphonies, knowing composers of his time, knowing Czech music, you know, uh, bohemian music, knowing um, you know, the composers that came before him, that came after him, you know, that he was highly influenced by Brahms, um, that he was part of this nationalistic movement of, of music, setting a lot of these bohemian and Czech, um, Czech melodies and whatnot. Um, all this gives a deeper understanding that allows you to connect with the piece more. One of my favorite experiences was performing the Dvorak Requiem, you know, in Dvorak Hall in Prague, and it's hard to, um, to have an experience as powerful as that. Um, it was such a wonderful experience, both collaborating with the orchestra, but also being in that place and time. Um, a wonderful audience, wonderful performers, and I think collectively we all felt a sense of, um, of meaningfulness from that particular performance. You know, when you perform another work of the same composer and you have experiences like that, you can build off of that. And there's so many connections between the Requiem and the Stop of Modern. Obviously, they're both symphonic choral works, but the way of setting the text, I think, for Dvorak is very interesting because he takes you on a journey within the, the music. The harmonies, he can say with, this, with the text the same thing three times in a row, but harmonically and melodically will completely change the color in which he approaches that and how he states that statement. There's a reason why music has been a part of every single culture that has ever existed in humankind. And part of that reason is that, you know, it allows us to express and to feel things and act in, act in some sort of cathartic manner. 
Uh, Daniel Levitin, who is this um, cognitive scientist, talks about sort of the function of music and how he feels that there are technically no sad songs. Because the idea is that music will connect to whatever negative feelings that we have and serve to soothe those feelings through compassion and empathy. And so music, that's why it has such a cathartic function, is that it lifts our spirits. And whereas before we used to talk in such you know, non-specific language where it says it soothes your soul, it's, it lifts your spirits, there is specific cognitive science that actually backs it up and says that because of the release of endorphins, because of its feeling, um, um, making your body feel good, it allows us to have that cathartic nature, to have that empathy, and whereas we feel Dvorak's pain, that allows us to also participate in what it meant to him to have that performed and how that connects to our, um, our feelings and helps relieve us of the negativity. And so especially in now, things nowadays where people, it's a very, if a lot of people feel stress, whatever side of the political aisle you are on, you know, um, I think that it's important to have things, music like this, which serves in that manner to bring us together and, you know, reflects sort of the culture of BCCO, which is that as a community we come together to perform these great works and that music can bring us together and especially for a work as meaningful and as deep as the Dvorak Stava Mater, it really feels every single Monday that we try to achieve that.